Now, if God wanted to forgive us our sins, why didn't he just forgive them? Why did he have to torture, have his son tortured? That's a very good question. Well, what's your answer? Genesis. How does Genesis answer that question? Because Adam was made perfect. And what happened through his disobedience, if you like, simple uh, test, and he lost that perfection for us, for us all as a human race, according to scripture. And the need for a Messiah or uh, another perfect being of the same degree of perfection uh, could only be the proper ransom for our redemption. God was in a position to accept any ransom he chose, presumably. Why on earth would he have his son tortured for the sin of somebody who lived how long before? For, for 4,000 years before, if you believe that Adam did? Because Adam scrumped an apple. Why would that sin reverberate down the ages and have to be uh, redeemed by the torturing of God's own son? Why didn't God say, I forgive you, I forgive you? It, I, it's in my power to be, no, what he said was, my son has to be tortured to death, no. just like mm. Abraham. I don't think that was the way, I, well, certainly not the way I read it, but I see it, uh, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son well, as a ransom you, sacrifice. You're quoting scripture again, but um, why wouldn't God just forgive us if that's what he wanted to he do? He could have done it that way, but he chose being uh, the sort, the God that he is, he, allowing for... Um, us to have free will and it wasn't just grumping an apple uh, there's more to it than that um, Adam was plainly disobedient and I think he even admits it himself in the fact that he uh, hid from God that particular evening because there was a, a fellowship between man and God um, every day so Adam was disobedient and that sin reverberated down the ages is inherited by all humans mm. What kind of a doctrine is that, inherited by all humans and had to be redeemed by the Son of God being tortured to death? What kind of a morality are you propagating there? That's a very good question. Uh, Paul puts it very well in Romans chapter 5. Well, Paul invented it, so he would. No, because Paul was in the era at the time of Christ and mm. we're talking 4,000 years before that. Um, Paul said that just through one man's uh, disobedience, Adam, uh, death came th to all mankind because all have sinned. You know, it's, it's, that's why we needed another perfect life. And Paul talks about it very clearly, much better than I do, uh, that the, the ransom price had to be a perfect life. And that's another reason why he was born of a virgin and had no earthly father, um, because of the bloodline. But, you know, we... We could argue all day about these things, and I haven't even got to some of the uh, emails. On, but okay. um, but I, please, Richard, uh, mm. you know, s see my heart, not not my intellect, because my heart is for mankind as well. Oh, I can see that. You know, yes. and uh, mm. we, you know, we mm. we both care for the future, and um, but uh, you know, I just wondered, and I, I mean this with all sincerity, you know, is that is there something in particular that, that really you can't stand about God. About? God. Uh, well, I don't think God, God exists, so, that, so obviously I, that, that wouldn't apply. Uh, there's something but I can't stand about Christianity, which is just what I've been saying about this, this really obnoxious doctrine of original sin, which I think is, is, is actually hideous and uh, demeaning, and um, is, um, it's, a, it's a vengeful doctrine. Um, it's the idea that, uh, that one can be um, absolved that, that, uh, that a sin by somebody else has to be paid for by a different person, which is a, which is a horrible idea. Um, it's well, everything just, about it is, okay. a, is an obnoxious doctrine. I, 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 again, I can see where you're coming from, and I, and I mean that with all sincerity. But let's take the case, say, uh, of a, a thief has gone before the courts and he's guilty, even though he might have uh, said he wasn't guilty. Uh, you know, it's proven he is. Uh, without doubt and he's sentenced um, and quite rightly so the judge because he's a good judge he says right you're guilty but I'm gonna pay your fine or even go to prison for it in a way simple way that that's the way I see how God set up um, the 
for his son to be the ultimate sacrifice. And that, I can't think well, of... Well, that would be persuasive if the judge said, you're forgiven. That, that would be great. That, that would be the kind of thing one could empathize with. But that's not what he said. He said, OK, we're going to hang somebody else for your, for your crime. Um, no, the, the judge said, I'll give you my son. Now, wouldn't that be incredible? Uh, I think it would be disgusting. I mean, I think, I think it's a horrible idea that, that, that somehow, the, given that the judge has all, is all-powerful, given that the judge has the power to forgive if he wants to, that the only way he can do it is to sacrifice his son I mean, what an incredibly unpleasant way to do it, when, when, given that you've got the power to forgive. You're all-powerful. I, I see it differently, that he, he loved us so much that he was willing to do that. And having just gone through uh, a terrible week with uh, the, the tragic death in our family, uh, sudden death of a young boy, we would have... You could see how much God must have gone through to see his son go through that painful that makes it sacrifice. Even worse. I mean, it makes it even, even worse, what he would, given that he could have simply forgiven. Well, forgiven well, us. Well, we don't know. For example, there could have been a conversation between the son and the father in heaven before coming down, and maybe in that sense, Jesus said, I will do it. It's and there could have been a... a, a, a but that presupposes honestly. that it was necessary for somebody to do it. Why not just? It had to be okay. somebody perfect. And but why did it have to be sin. somebody for, sacrificed at all? A life, a life for a life. A life for a life. Exactly. What kind of a morality is that? Well, I, I personally believe that that helps us to, to live, a good life and respect for each other. That I would stop if I was angry at someone from taking their life and letting it go further. But to forgive. Well, I would forgive as well, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a life for a life, which is very different. Mm. But you had some other questions, didn't you? Yes, we yes. did indeed. Um, many have come in, so let me just quickly go through these. Um, in your interview with Bill Moyers um, on the 3rd of December 2004 on PBS USA, uh, Richard is quoted as saying, evolution has been observed. It is just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. If evolution has not been observed while it is happening, then isn't your belief in evolution a belief by faith? And if so, how does this faith differ from the creationists? Evolution is a process that takes a very long time uh, to, for interesting things to happen anyway. It takes millions of years um, for really major evolutionary change to happen. Um, you can see it happening. Uh, I mean, we, we, we do see it happening in a small way, but of necessity, what you can see during a human lifetime is relatively short, li relatively little. And in my book, The Greatest Show on Earth, I've given some um, examples of that. But the, the burden of the question is, if you can't see it happening before your very eyes, doesn't that mean that you have to have faith in order to believe it? The answer is no, of course it doesn't. Uh, because what you see is the traces, the remains, you see the, uh, the consequences of the evolutionary process, even though you can't actually um, watch it happening before your very eyes. It's a bit like I've likened it to the process whereby a detective comes on the scene of a crime after the crime has been committed. Now, the detective can't actually see the crime being committed, but what he sees is fingerprints, footprints, bloodstains, scuffs on the carpet, um, all these sorts of evidence which add up to an understanding of how the crime was committed. So, fossils are of that type. DNA is of that type. If you look at the DNA in different animals, compare, you've got, we've got it up here, beautiful picture you've got for the backdrop. If you look at the DNA of different animals, for a start, all animals and plants have the same, the same DNA code, which is a remarkable fact in itself. And then uh, th there are minor differences in the actual sequences, the actual letters that are spelled out by the code. And if you look at those differences, you find that they form a perfect hierarchical pattern. It's a family tree. Now, this is massive, massive, massive quantities of evidence left lying around the earth in every species of creature that's ever been looked at is carrying around massive quantities of evidence in the DNA. Then there's fossils in the rocks, massive quantities of evidence, lots of other evidence. Yes. I mean, to me, in the closing 40 seconds that we have, Richard, is that the complexities of the DNA, to me, speak of a very intelligent designer. 
and not something that evolved over billions yes, of years. Yes, but you can't use the intelligent designer to explain anything because you have to explain where the intelligent designer came in the first place. The whole beauty of evolution is that it explains how you start with simplicity and work up to complexity, to the illusion of design. Richard, we're in the literally closing seconds. Would you kindly come back and talk to some of the other people that we have? I'd be happy to receive an invitation. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye.